Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our next excursion, Meander the Mud Flats. And we do have quite the team to make this happen. Um, my name is Dito O'Boyle. And then uh, we do have a couple of staff in the field that you will meet in a little bit. And you can smash their face to the picture down below. So first of all, a little bit about the reserve. We are Rookery Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve, and we are part of this big network. And we have a federal partner, that's NOAA, and there are almost 30 reserves around the country. And Florida is pretty darn lucky because we have three of them down here, um, including us. So we are down in Naples. Then there is um, Guanatana Matanza up in St. Augustine and Apalachicola in Apalachicola. We do have a state partner as well, and that is the Department of Environmental Protection. And they actually protect a lot of land here in Florida beyond the reserve system. It's about 4 million acres protected statewide. So it's a lot of these coastal areas, aquatic preserves that are being protected for public use. Now, we're Great Bay Reserve itself, we do have 110,000 acres. So everything on this map outlined in yellow, that star is where our learning center is located. And we are actually open at the moment. So definitely come down after the program, hopefully come and check us out. And while we protect this huge area, we are through this um, excursion series this summer, hopefully you want to reintroduce you, reintroduce you to parts of Rookery Bay. And so the team today is down south of our learning center on Marco Island. And I'll get into that a little bit more. Now, uh, this is a brief video from the Mangrove Coast. This is our director and he'll give you a nice little overview of Rookery Bay Reserve. Rookery Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve is a partnership between the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and NOAA. And it's really set up to enable long-term conservation, research, and education of this estuary. Rookery Bay was set aside 40 years ago now as a living laboratory to study how mangrove ecosystems function and also to protect this really unique ecosystem. And through the efforts of grassroots conservation, through the 60s and up through today, we're actually able to have this place set aside so it'll be there in perpetuity. So generations of families can actually enjoy these resources and also use them as well. As you educate people, they understand how important this resource is and they actually will take personal ownership and stake and stewardship in protecting this resource. And the more you learn about it, the more they come back and protect it. We are stewards. We have been given the responsibility to protect these areas so they will persist forever. If you are interested in watching that whole documentary, you can actually watch it on PBS. It's called Mangrove Coast. So we're Green Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. We do have a mission statement. It is to serve Southwest Florida as a trusted resource for science-based information to foster connected human and ecological communities. So what does this mean? We hope to see communities in Southwest Florida value nature and prosper in concert with healthy estuaries. So as much as we are about managing, protecting the area within our boundaries, we also want to make sure that people are enjoying it and that it is healthy enough to support guests enjoying the area. 
So why are estuaries so important? What's the big deal about estuaries? Well, there's a few different reasons. And uh, a big one has to do with the fact that they are extremely productive. So down here in Southwest Florida, we're really lucky. We are a mangrove dominated estuary, which is pretty rare in the system. Um, usually there's other types of vegetation that are the dominant in that estuarine area. But our mangrove leaves are constantly dropping. And when they fall into the water, they add this rich wealth of nutrients into the water. Because if you think about the open ocean, most of it is a desert. And so lots of animals are drawn into these coastal areas, in particular estuaries, because there is so much food. And because of that food and this huge influx of animals coming in, it makes it really, really important, not just for a biodiversity standpoint, but also for an economic. There is a huge industry down here for fishing and either um, you know just for fun or also to buy it in restaurants. That's a very big industry. How many of your friends come and visit just to buy seafood or to get out on you know, a fishing vessel? or also go out and enjoy the beach, soak up the sun, go kayaking. All of that's possible because of a healthy ecosystem and which is our estuaries are essential to. Estuaries also offer storm protection. So in this video, you can see this wave machine is producing those nice size waves. It hits the model mangroves and then it's calm afterward. So when we get those tropical storms or hurricanes coming towards the coast, they hit our barrier islands and our mangrove islands and the waves get a little bit smaller and the wind gets slower. So they actually help protect the, uh, the main coastline from the storm damage. And of course, because of that productivity, they provide a habitat for a lot of different wildlife. They use our estuaries as a nursery. Yes, that is a baby sea turtle crawling out to sea in the bottom left. Um, but this can be a huge range of animals from the threatened sawfish all the way up to the birds that are roosting in our mangrove trees. And with that, I am going to share a map of where the team is today and where you are going to find them. So one second while I pull that up. It's gonna pull up a duplicate of what you're looking at, my apologies. All right, so I'm gonna take you on a little road trip virtually down from Rookery Bay Learning Center, which you saw on that map located right here, all the way down to where the team is. So first of all, when you're at the Learning Center, you're gonna get back on this big road, Collier Boulevard. I don't know what my computer just did, so my apologies. Hopefully it will correct itself. Let me go to the next slide. We always uh, check for um, technical issues and they always try to throw new ones at us. That's always a fun game. All right, there we go. So we are going to go start at Rickery Bay head down on Collier Boulevard. I apologize if you get motion sickness. Um, and you are going to turn right off of Kendall from Collier Boulevard. Right here, you're gonna turn at Kendall. You are gonna be in a community. And when you are on Marco Island, you've heard me say this before, but definitely keep your eyes peeled out for burrowing owls. They are quite the treat to see and they nest in people's yards. Absolutely amazing birds that are active during the day and they build their nests in the ground. Pretty unique for owls. Now, once you're on Kendall Drive, you're gonna drive quite a while, take a left on Hernando. Again, you are still in communities and I promise you this does take you to one of the most um, more natural uh, lagoon systems here in the area you can check out. And then this will dead end right into Tiger Tail Beach. And you can get in here with a Naples Beach sticker or you can pay um, admission to come into this beach and it is definitely worth it. 
And then there is a parking lot. There's a nice place. You can take a pit stop, um, use the restroom. They do have a tide chart in there. I highly recommend you check out because that's going to dictate a little bit about how you're going to be able to use the beach. And they also will let you know if there's red tide or rip currents or anything uh, you want to watch out for while you're at the beach. So this is again, this is where the bathrooms are located. There's actually a nice new playground they just did. They do have some shell guides as well there. And if you need to pick up a snack to get yourself going, there's uh, that availability as well. All right, so we're gonna get to the fun stuff. Here is the lagoon side of Tiger Tail Beach and check out this mud. So today is meander the mud flats, and I don't think this is what it looks like right now for the teams. That's why I want to give you a nice view of what happens there at a low tide. All right, and I am going to turn it over to our field cam. Are you ready? And our field cam is just coming on. I'm going to stop sharing and hand it over. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Can you see and hear us okay? You sound great. Awesome. Okay, welcome. Hello from the field. My name is Morgan. I'm the, on the education team here at Rookery Bay, and I'm joined here by our summer intern, Aubrey. Hi. And we are here to explore one of the coolest public access places within Rookery Bay Research Reserve. So that is the theme for the summer is Rediscover Rookery Bay. Our Environmental Learning Center is open for business and so is the environment that surrounds us, right, Aubrey? Oh yeah, so Morgan, where are we? Oh, so we are at Tiger Tail Lagoon, like Dina told you. We are out here on the lagoon side because there is a beach side and it is busy here today, folks. We've got people crossing over to get to the nice white sand beaches, but we do have some brave fishermen uh, and other recreators staying on the lagoon side to enjoy just what we're here to talk about, the mud flat. So what is so special about this place? You know, on top of it being public access, it is one of the coolest places to see a bunch of different habitats we've been focusing on all summer. We are surrounded by our mangrove forest. And Dita said, it is one of those most unique habitats that we could have here in Southwest Florida. And our estuary is covered by them. So we are surrounded by all three types of mangroves here. And if you tuned in to our excursion about mangroves, we told you all about them. But you can check out our website and see if you missed it. But we talked about seagrass last time we were here, right? Oh, oh yeah. We explored it. We got hands in, hands on with our seagrass. And we even saw some of those fishermen catching some nice sized fish right out of the seagrass beds here at Tiger Tail Lagoon. <laughs> so I have to ask Morgan, what exactly is a mud flat? Woo, Aubrey, I'm so glad you asked. So for all my folks at home who've only recreated on our white sand beaches, I'm sorry to break it to you. These mud Whoa. flats, check out this silty, sandy mix. And some people might think it's gross, but a mud flat is just one of those places where sand and silt and decomposing material is deposited, right? And it usually lies just below the surface. So if you look behind us, you can see, we can see it right through that nice shallow water and it's nice and clear. Check that out. How does it smell, Morgan? You know, I would say it's ripe, uh, very, very ripe. <laughs> nice strong sulfur smell, decomposing material. Use your imagination for that one. Uh, but yes, as the tide continues to get lower, uh, I believe the smell will get stronger because more of that mud flap will be showing. So can a mud flap be more than just mud? Oh, you got that right. So mud flats are not just sand and silt and this gross stuff that I was showing you, right? This isn't gross. This is the building block of our estuary. This muddy, silty sand is like the producer of all producers. It's so nutrient dense because things like our mangrove leaves that we've talked about already throughout these excursions are decomposing, right? Contributing to that nutrient source within our beautiful pristine estuary. And that allows it to function as not only just this little piece of a sandbar or mud flat, but as a habitat and a foraging ground. How is it a habitat? Who, who lives in this habitat? 
Wow, that is awesome. We actually found some critters that we're gonna show you that use the mudflat as a habitat. We've got some insect action, so I'm sorry if our audio is getting a little funky. See, this place is so active with people and insects and critters. So if we were to see this area uh, submerged, which we do now, there's gonna be a host of critters that use it as a habitat when it's covered with water. And one of those is our snails. So if you get a good feel for our crown conch here, we picked up a bunch of these little cruisers along the mud flat looking for a good snack. And Aubrey, what did this crown conch have in its grasp when we found it? Right when we found it, it was eating a clam that was down deep in the mud. So it was foraging for food there. Check this out. So we can see it went in on a little bit of breakfast, ate this clam, and it was using our mudflat as that perfect foraging ground as it's covered by water. That's so crazy cool. And I think we also found another animal that was using our mudflat, didn't we, Aubrey? Oh, yes, we did. So while we were foraging around, we found a worm. Check this out. So what's really neat about our mudflats is that the mud itself is soft and it's squishy, right? So when we're tromping around out here, can you hear that? Yeah, well, it's soft enough that these animals like worms can burrow down, put themselves in the mud and use it as a refuge to hide. Morgan, so, can you point to it with your other hand? It's kind of hard to see it. Okay, there you go. Let's clear out some of the mud off my hand. How about that? Yeah, look at that. So a small segmented worm was just one of the cool finds we dug up from the mud this morning on our adventures. But yeah, so what's really cool is that not only can worms of this type use our mud flats, but we see a lot of worms that build themselves tubes. And we have a picture that Dita might be able to pull up. And I'm thinking more specifically a parchment tube worm. So out here, a parchment tube worm will build this nice parchment paper-like casing and have two little openings at either end, right? Not only will the worm live in there, but other critters can use the worm tube as habitat. So it's like a habitat within a habitat. How amazing is that? I mean, if you were out here to explore with us today, we've been searching all over for one of those. We haven't found it yet, uh, but don't fret. We found a different worm, found a bunch of cool snails eating, using this as a foraging ground. But this place will look really different uh, in just about a few hours. What's gonna be different, Aubrey? So instead of it being submerged in water, once the tide goes back out to the Gulf of Mexico, you're gonna start seeing the mud being more visible. And this is a great way where now birds can come down and forage and find some really yummy fruit. So you're telling me birds are gonna use mud flats? Yes. Oh my gosh. Well, we just saw an example of it. We have a reddish egret to our background. Can you all see this? Yes. So we have a reddish egret that's just waiting, biting at the bit for our tide to recede, like Aubrey said, go back out, get sucked back into the Gulf of Mexico and expose all of that awesome mud. And I'm thinking this reddish egret's looking for things like crabs, maybe a small fish that was left behind by the tide, some other small invertebrates. It might not be too picky if there's not much on the mud, but as we've seen so far, there's a ton of stuff to find. So the birds need it, our snails need it, our worms need it. There's also another crab that we've been seeing a ton of that need this. So as you go a little bit higher near the mangroves, you're gonna find these fiddler crabs and they're so unique for their big giant claws. What? Are you telling me that's real? Oh yeah, it oh, is. Oh my goodness. Not just the cartoons. <laughs> Not just a cartoon, we don't play around here. So fiddler crabs are a really good indicator of how long that mudfly has been exposed. So if you've ever been to the beach or in our mangrove lagoon side areas, you might see these little tiny burrows, like someone just drilled a hole in it all over the place. And there's these little sand pellets that look like they've been sprinkled along, it's like sand snow, right? Aubrey, we saw a ton oh, yeah. of them over there and we weren't fast enough to catch a fiddler crab. It's because they're using their burrows to hide from things like us and birds. But if you were to see them in action, that their claws, are used to either dig their burrow. So that's when you see the really big clumps of sand and silt and mud. And then the little teeny tiny balls are from when they're feeding and sifting through that silky, sandy, muddy mess wow. to find food. Wow. I mean, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a lot of food all within this big clump of mud, right? Unbelievable. <laughs> 
And again, we've lost about a foot of water out here already. Uh, and our low tide will just be about 1230. So all these people crossing over our mud flat right now, uh, they might have some better luck not getting too wet on their way back. So now that the public understand what's going on here, how, is there a way that they can come out here and experience it for themselves and rediscover? Mm -hmm. They definitely can. So like all these people you've kind of heard and maybe seen passing by, they're coming to recreate here for one reason or another. Like Dita said, they might be fishing, kayaking, exploring the beach, getting some sun, or maybe doing what we're doing and going on a snail hunt. So we didn't just find one snail. We found a ton. And if you're into nature like we are, we just think this is so fun to go seeking and finding all of the cool critters that we could find on our mud flats. So Can you hold it up a little, Morgan. We can't quite see it. Yeah, there you go. Sure. How's that? Whoa! Look at all these crown conks. So this is just one other way you can come out and really connect yourself with our surroundings and our estuary. On top of kayaking and doing all of the fun things. But like Dita said, it's just a short drive through Marco Island. You come here. If you have a beach pass, that's awesome. Parking is $8 otherwise. But you can just come out here and explore and really immerse yourself in our local estuarine environment because it is so beautiful. I mean, you can't beat this. <laughs> now, Morgan, I think there is, um, the last time I went to Tiger Tail, there is an area behind you. If you go that way, that's roped off. Mm -hmm. why yes. is that so we can't see it from here but take our word for it there is a small area of it's more high ground so it's more sandy than muddy but still really important uh it's a critical wildlife area and it's roped off because our birds our beach nesting birds are nesting here at this time of year so they've closed off that particular area that they found to be perfect for nesting and we can't go in there even, Aubrey, right? We nope. just, we can observe from a distance, just like all the folks who are coming to Tiger Tail to explore our mud flats. But when they go out there, you can really get a nice feel for just how many birds use this area, not only in our mud flats, but for the critical wildlife area to reproduce. Thank you so much for that. I've been really enjoying uh, watching that reddish egret just dance around behind you guys. <laughs> he seems to be enjoying whatever he's catching. Oh my gosh, absolutely. And we've lost a ton of water already. So like I said, he is just chomping at the bit, trying to get some food. <laughs> and now I know there's a lot of, um, it seems like there's a lot of different shorebirds and wading birds that are in the area. And you mentioned that the mud is a good foraging ground for them. Aren't they competing with each other then? Or how does that not, how does it support all those different birds? Well, as you just saw in our like 10 minute walk, we found a bunch of snails, we found a worm, there's a bunch of fiddler crabs and a bunch of other critters, like smaller invertebrates that we couldn't even see with our own eyes. So yeah, when those mud flats are exposed, depending on their elevation and how much uh, sediment has been deposited there, it will really determine their size. And you know, when there's a small mud flat and there's a lot of birds that want in on that party, there will be a little bit of competition there for food because uh, there's not you know, oodles of food everywhere. But uh, around here, when the tide goes out, there are plenty of mudflats to sustain all sorts of birds. We've seen roseate spoonbills out here using their spoon-like bill to <laughs> sift through the mud. If you've ever seen a video of one or seen one in person, it is so cool. Uh, YouTube it, it's really fun. But we see our wading birds, our egrets and our herons. And then we also see some uh, high flyers, our birds of prey, like osprey, even sometimes juvenile eagles, uh, and a swallowtail kite here and there. Um, but that's if we're lucky. Now, I have to be honest, um, mud is not my favorite thing, shall we say. Mm -hmm. And so if I want to go out there and it looks like some of those snails you're holding were pretty sharp. Is there anything you recommend if I want to get the most out of exploring a mud flat? <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, like we said, we encourage you to come out here and explore but we came prepared today, Aubrey. We are in our sun protection. We've got long sleeves, long pants because we know how many animals use this area. We don't know what we'll encounter, but the biggest thing, let me see if I can get it in here, closed toed shoes, uh, nice tight fitting water shoes that you're not afraid to tromp around a little bit with a hard sole, okay? So that is my biggest recommendation is a closed toes shoes and even bring in a dip net if you want. Uh, you never know what you'll come across. 
but water, sun protection, closed toed shoes. That's three big ones. That sounds like a great recommendation. Now I do, um, I was wondering if there's anything, any big surprises that you found while you've been looking in the mud or trying to find things while you've been out? That's a great question, Dita. So today, Aubrey and I, as we were searching on our snail hunt uh, to find all the cool critters to show you all, we discovered these balloon-like stacks, didn't we? Yes, they're everywhere, literally everywhere. And we went back and forth. We said, is this a jellyfish? It could be, maybe not. We pulled out an ID guide and we actually determined that we were looking at egg casings. We're not exactly sure what from because field ID of anything, uh, especially egg casings is difficult. Yes. But we did determine we are seeing hundreds of these pouches of eggs uh, just below the surface. And we can't pull them up because they're attached to the bottom and then they would just fall apart. So right. we're not gonna disturb them. But that was one of the biggest surprises I think this morning. Uh, we saw hundreds of those little pouches. I think one of my favorite things I've seen there are uh, the little horseshoe crabs. And they're so hard to find, but I think there's kind of an art to finding them, isn't there? You can look for some clues if you're looking for them at the mud flats. Absolutely. So horseshoe crab CSI, uh, we actually found one on our last excursion. So again, I'm plugging our recordings. Go to our website, check that out. It was so cool. You can almost follow their tracks, uh, just like any other animal, right? So if you know what you're looking for, they kind of push the sand and the mud and they burrow down just below the surface. And they're one of those animals with a hard outer shell too. Uh, not as hard as a snail, but still, it would give you a poke, but you wanna be really diligent, look around for those tracks and they will be right below the surface. They're so cool. They're ancient. Uh, they're actually more related to spiders uh, than they are crabs. So that's pretty crazy. Um, and again, another great surprise that we may or may not encounter while we're out here exploring our mud flats. Uh, it's different every single time. That's awesome. I could not wait to go out and see a little teeny horseshoe crab again. <laughs> now, you know, is we are having a tractor drive by. So we apologize for any audio disruption. Uh, just give us like a second. <laughs> But that's a good talking point. If you can still hear us, uh, they are kind of tilling up the more beachy, higher ground of our mudflats here uh, to aerate the soil, right? Because like I said, it is ripe here right now and not everyone is as fond of mud as Aubrey and I, um, but they're doing that just to ease the recreation on the lagoon side. But yeah, it's crazy to see the difference of a really settled mudflat versus uh, some nice tilled up sand uh, mixed in with that mud. It's, it's a huge difference. Are there any um, fish in the area that kind of rely on those muddy areas to live in or to kind of forage over? Yes, absolutely. So if you've tuned into one of our other excursions when we did a staining trip, uh, that's where we use a big net with poles on either side and we sample the fish in an area. There are a lot of fish that will use the bottom or be bottom dwellers. The word for that is called benthic. And we see things like blennies and gobies. And just recently we saw a gulf toadfish, and they are crazy. They're called oyster crushers. They have powerful jaws. And all of these adaptations that these bottom dwelling or benthic fish share is that they are gonna sit down, they're gonna wait, they're gonna ambush their prey. Their coloration has to be spot on because if you don't blend into your surroundings and use camouflage, you're pretty easy bait for another critter using the mud flat uh, for a foraging ground. So if you're foraging, you don't wanna be foraged on. So that's a key. Those fish, those benthic fish need to have good cryptic coloration and they're just gonna sit back and wait. They're gonna say, hey, I'm gonna wait for my perfect prey item and snatch it when it comes along. That's awesome. I definitely love those toad fish. They're pretty darn cute. <laughs> Neat, they're so fun. And we've been seeing a lot of fishing happening today. Some, some really good fishing actually. Uh, they've caught things like what did they catch today, Aubrey? They pay, so today they got redfish. And I heard they also got a mangrove snapper last time they came here. Wow. So great fishing spot for any of you fisher men and women out there. Definitely. And so that in conjunction with our mudflats, our mangroves, our seagrass, all of those habitats are working together. It's all interconnected to allow for this beautiful, productive, pristine mangrove estuary. I mean, Aubrey, you just can't beat it out here today. You cannot, it's beautiful. 
Well, thank you so much for joining us from the field. What I'm going to do is actually share a flyer of all of our upcoming programs while I ask the audience to put their questions in the box because we want to make sure that your question gets answered before we end today. So I'm going to go ahead and share this flyer of all of our upcoming stuff and talk just a little bit about it. And then in the chat box, I've put the link where you can register to all of our programs. So as you know, this Edscursion is part of a series. This summer's theme is called Rediscover Rookery Bay because we want to show you places that you can explore locally. So today we meandered the mud flats. In August, we're going to observe the oysters and we're going to close out at the end of August with the beauty of the beach back at Tiger Tail Beach where the ladies are right now. And that's not all. We have more programs. We have some in-person programs. We just finished summer camp. We have boat and kayak tours that are guided with our eco-tour operator. And our environmental learning center is open. After being closed for some time, we are reopened and better than ever. So come check us out. And soon to be announced, we will be opening on Saturdays starting in the end of September. September 25th will be our first Saturday open. So mark your day as we celebrate National Asteroids Day on that holiday. Now, one program I thought this audience might be interested in is called Break with the Birds. Now, this is a virtual lecture series, and it's virtual because we are in the field, kind of like today's program, with biologists that are doing cool stuff. So our upcoming program this month is actually on black skimmers. So if you'd like to learn more about those beautiful birds, we you can join us uh, for the Turns Turn lecture later this month. All right, I'm going to advance to the next slide if my computer cooperates here and thank everyone for attending. And then just give everyone the last opportunity to drop your questions in there because we wanna make sure that we answer them. I know there were a lot of questions earlier that we have answered already in the conversation. So if anyone, just has a new question right now. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so you can see all of us. And we're ready, fire away. See if you can stop the staff. <laughs> I think your comment about uh, the upcoming uh, break with the birds, Sarah, got some people interested. They were wondering, Morgan, um, it looks like some people have been to Tiger Tail before, but awesome. what are those black skimmers eating? Are they trying to eat things that are in the mud or they don't seem to go that deep? No, so we actually have seen a lot of black skimmers here today and we've heard them uh, kind of sailing above looking for some food. They are not a particular bird that will be using our mud flats in particular, but like I said, all of these habitats here at the Tiger Tail Lagoon are contributing to that productive estuary and all of this food source that's available for all the critters. But our black skimmers are really neat. If you've ever seen an up close picture, their lower mandible or their lower jaw sticks out just a little further than their top one. And they use it like a scoop. Think of it when you're scooping soup out of a bowl with a spoon, same thing. They're gonna skim right across the surface of some shallow water, looking for some small fish, maybe some small invertebrates. And they're just whoop, scooping it right off the top. They're not going down in the mud like our spoonbills or our wading birds. Um, they're just not as specialized for that. But man, are they successful at fishing here? We saw a ton this morning. And they're so beautiful nah. too. The last one has to do with the color of the waters. You are in a very muddy environment. So is that why the water is that color because of all that mud? So yes and no. So it's what goes into the mud that's really kind of contributing to the color of our estuarine waters. So right at the beginning, we said our decomposing material, these are mangrove leaves that I just picked up right around us. There's hundreds, if not thousands, if not millions. Uh, and they are breaking down. And what's neat is that our mangrove leaves have tannins in them. So if you ever drink tea or wine, uh, when you put in those leaves, they break down and release tannins, which as we can see, it creates this brownish kind of tan color that is not dirty. Oh, by no means is it dirty. It is nutrient dense and it is amazing for all of these critters to build upon because once these break down, it releases nutrients back into the sand and the soil and the mud and then it just allows it to build up from there. So yes, not dirty here. Uh, but if you're afraid of the mud, don't be. This, this whole point of the program is to expose you <laughs> to the exposed mud that allows so many cool things to happen here at Tiger Tail. 
Well, I feel like I know a lot more about the ecosystem. Hopefully you guys do too. So we're going to close out our program for today. Um, and again, you'll get the link in your email to the Excursion page where you can sign up for future events, watch today and previous programs as well. So check out the link I put in the chat box to sign up for any of our upcoming programs and tune for more to come. Thank you for joining us today. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye.